Hello there and welcome to my studio. If you are new to the world of soft pastels and pastel pencils, then look no further than this video. I'm going to talk you through the very best soft pastel sticks and pencils along with my favorite tools to use. I'm also going to give you all of my tips for staying safe with soft pastels as well as how to frame the artworks that you create. I will then finish off with my methods and techniques and finally I will walk you through how to create a realistic drawing of sliced oranges towards the end. Soft pastels and pastel pencils are the same medium just in a different form. Soft pastels come in a stick form whereas pastel pencils come in pencil form. Therefore both work great when put together and can be used to create really impressive artworks. They are very easy to work with, they blend very well together and they can be used to create really impressive artworks that you're proud of. This video is packed with the most helpful information and tips throughout so make sure you watch it all the way through so that you don't miss anything. Please also feel free to ask any questions that you may have and I will do my best to get back to you as soon as possible. The very first thing I would like to talk about is the drawing surface. I think the most important part about creating high quality soft pastel artworks is having the correct type of paper to start with. Soft pastels are soft and dusty, they need a surface they can stick and bind to. Unlike oil pastels which are waxy, soft pastels are more like dry chalk. Using a very smooth paper won't work, the pigment will simply fall or wipe off. There are a few different pastel paper brands for you to try out, each of them come with negative and positive qualities. Here are a few I have lying around but to save you the hassle of trying to find out which paper is the best, I'll just tell you. After many trials and errors, I have found that Pastel Matte by Claire Fontaine is the number one option. And I know I'm in good hands as the high majority of other soft pastel artists I know also use this paper. Pastel matte has a lightly sanded surface and this gives it the ability to hold many layers and it's even able to hold the pastel well enough so that artworks do not need any fixative spray. This is good news as all fixatives dull the colours and tones so I always avoid using them. Pastel matte is available for purchase as just the paper or you can also buy pastel matte board which is my favourite. Pastel matte board is simply the pastel matte paper paired with a 1.8mm backing board. This keeps the paper from bending or warping. This is especially useful if you like to work upright on an easel for example. This paper also comes in a variety of sizes. You can buy pads of different sizes all the way up to 30 to 40 centimeters, but you can also buy sheets and boards all the way up to 1 meter by 70 centimeters. This is great for me as I love drawing in large scale. Pastel matte also comes in a wide variety of colours such as white, sienna, light grey, dark grey, brown, light blue, dark blue and so on. My personal favourites are white for the simplicity but I also love working on dark grey and brown paper. With these last two colours you can easily experiment with white and very light pastels in a way on white paper you cannot. Here you can see how having different colour paper can transform how you see the drawing and open up the different possibilities for your artworks. I personally love working on grey paper as it's halfway between white and black, meaning the tones and the colours won't be distorted against the harsh white background as can happen. Nevertheless, I also love using white paper when I am leaving the background blank. It gives the artwork a really professional look in my opinion and the white background helps to focus the audience in towards the subject. Whatever paper you decide to try, definitely give Pastel Matt a go as I guarantee you will find some great results with it. I have linked where to find it below in the description if you are interested. Next up is an introduction to soft pastel sticks. I have also tried and tested many different soft pastel stick brands and I'm happy to talk you through what I find works the best. Soft pastels are simply sticks of pigment that is mixed in with binder to keep their shape. Soft pastel sticks are dry and chalk like. I will show you some of my favourite brands and their properties now. Unison Colour soft pastel sticks are one of my favourites to work with. They are a really great size and they're very smooth to apply to the paper. I find that their colours are not as intense as some of the other brands such as Shamike which I actually find very useful in a lot of cases. Unison Colour has a huge range of 374 different colours to choose from. I think Unison Colour Soft Pastels are the perfect choice for beginners as they have many different sets to choose from as well. 
They feel very smooth when applied to the paper and they blend together very nicely. It may be important to note that you can mix any brand of soft pastel together and they will mix normally as they would with their own. Shmike soft pastel sticks are another favourite brand of mine. These soft pastels are such high quality and they make the creating experience even more enjoyable. They are smaller than the Unison Colour Soft Pastel Sticks but I also find them to be more intense so less is needed. Like Unison Colour they also have a crazy number of colours to choose from, 400 in total. This brand also has a huge range of greys which is excellent and they also produce my favourite deepest black which is the Sirius Black 97D for those of you who may want to know. Finally we have Rembrandt which is another great brand of soft pastels to use. They are relatively inexpensive and there's less colours to choose from than most but they're still a very powerful addition within my soft pastel stick collection. They are a very similar size and shape to the Schmieke soft pastels. I find them to be harder than some of the other sticks that I use which means they're usually less dusty. It also helps to resist breaking and crumbling and it also makes it a bit easier to control how much is deposited on the paper. And even though these brands of soft pastels already have a huge range of colours, you can still mix and blend multiple colours together for endless possibilities, so that you're never limited in what colour you can put to paper. You may purchase soft pastels in sets sold by the company brand, or you can use artist supply websites such as jacksonsart.com which also sell the individual colours. This is perfect for replacing those colours that you're running out of so that you don't have to keep buying new sets each time. If you would like to find the useful links to purchase any of these pastels, I have put them in the description below for you to check out. Keep watching to make sure you don't miss out on my absolute go-to methods and techniques when using soft pastel sticks. This next section is all about pastel pencils. These are wood encased thin sticks of soft pastel. They are essential to my pastel artworks, perfect for fine detail and mark making. Pastel pencils come in many different brands and each different brand has a different property throughout. It's important to note that some brands produce softer pastel pencils whereas other brands produce harder pencils. Softer pastel pencils will make for more opaque lines but they lose their sharp tip quicker. They are ideal for strong bold lines. Harder pastel pencils on the other hand are less prone to breaking and they stay pointier for longer, but they're less opaque and vibrant. They are ideal for shading and very fine details. I will now give you a quick run through of some of my favourite brands that work perfectly for me. Stabilo Carbothello pastel pencils are some of the first pastel pencils I ever purchased and they have remained one of my all time favourite brands. These pencils are of excellent quality and on the cheaper side. I find that they break less than other brands which is very important when it comes to pastel pencils and they also come in a huge range of colours. They are a perfect mixture of being in between soft and hard. You can start to see how easily they blend together no matter the colour. If you are looking for your first set of soft pastels, I highly recommend this brand as the quality is incredible for the price they sell for. As they are a great mixture between hard and soft, I think it is a great place for beginners to start with. Faber Castell Pitt Pastel Pencils are another strong brand of pencils that I use. They are on the harder side so I like to use them for some of the thin lines that I need to produce, such as some of the fine fur details when drawing animals for example. They are very easy to sharpen and they're probably the brand of pastel pencils that are least likely to break in my opinion. I do find this brand to be less on the opaque side, mainly because they are a hard pastel so even their brightest colours may be dimmer than the other brands. They do also come in a wide variety of colours to choose from though, you can buy these in large sets or individually on artist supply websites. Karen Dash Pastel Pencils are very unique due to how soft they are. If you need a wide range of bold, highly opaque pastel pencils then look no further than this brand. They are on the pricier side but they make up for it with the quality of each pencil being very high. I also just love the extra details, such as the wood casing being a hexagon shape so that they don't accidentally roll away off your desk. 
I always use this brand of pencil for my most vibrant and outstanding areas. Bronzy or pastel pencils are another pencil that flows in between being soft and hard, but perhaps slightly on the softer side. They come in a limited range of colours, but I find their colours to be very unique and therefore a very useful addition to my pencil collection. They are also very affordable and I find myself gravitating towards them a lot due to their high quality and ease of use. I also really like the different unique shades of grey they offer which can sometimes be hard to find with pastels. As you can see this brand blends together very easily, they are also very affordable so I think they would make a great addition to anyone's collection. Sometimes it's hard to find a deep black when it comes to pastel pencils, which can be crucial for some artworks. There is a pencil that outperforms the rest though. Let's take the black Carbothello, Faber-Castell Pitt and Caran d'Ache pastel pencils and compare how black they are. As you can see, they are all pretty similar. However, the deepest black pencil on the market isn't actually a pastel pencil as such. It's called the Cretacolor Black Chalk Pencil. Finding a black that is very pigmented is definitely worth it. I'll link the exact pencil in the description for you to find. It may be hard to see how much of a deeper black the Creta colour is, so if I draw a line with it over each of the other brands, you can see the difference straight away. Choosing a deep black such as this for the very darkest areas will help to keep the contrast high in your artworks. Just as a side note, the Caran d'Ache Chinese White Pastel Pencil is the most pigmented white currently available. Like with the soft pastels, you can purchase pastel pencils in sets or you can use artist supply websites which will sell the individual colours. This is vital for replacing colours that you are running out of so that you don't have to keep buying new sets every time. If you would like to find the useful links to purchase the pastel pencils mentioned, I have listed them in the description for you to check out also. Before I move on to my favourite tools to use, I want to quickly let you know about my Patreon channel, especially for those of you who may be frustrated with your art and are very keen to create realistic drawings. I have many beginner friendly real time videos and tutorials there to really guide you on how to create incredibly detailed artworks, with subject matter ranging from animals to humans, as well as different mediums including soft pastel, oil paint and graphite. For a small monthly fee, you can instantly unlock all of the lessons which will include a full list of the materials needed, as well as any reference photos so you can draw and paint along with me. My Patreon is designed to guide you in taking the next step with your art skills. You can find the link to it in the description or you can click the little card in the top right corner. Now let's get back to the video. Next up, I would like to talk about my essential tools that aid me with my soft pastel artworks. Like with any media, soft pastels and pastel pencils are greatly aided by the various tools that are available to us. Here I will list some of my favourite additions. The first tool I would like to share with you is soft sponge tools, and these are excellent for blending out the pastel pigment on your paper. Once I purchased a set of these tools, not only did my artworks greatly improve, but the ease of use and enjoyment also improved. This tool is simply a handle that allows a small changeable sponge to be attached to the end to use and blend out your soft pastel as desired. You can also use disposable eyeshadow sponges, but the long sturdy handle on these soft sponge tools makes life that much easier and quicker when creating soft pastel artworks. As you can see, there are a number of different shaped handles and sponge heads to choose from. I personally love the number 3 oval. Disposable eyeshadow sponges are not as efficient but still can be very useful for small and hard to reach areas due to their small size. Something else I also heavily rely on when working with soft pastels are disposable gloves. These are worn throughout the drawing for a couple of reasons. The first is to protect my hands from all the pastel dust and stop them from getting dirty and the other reason is to protect the artwork from the natural oils on my fingers. During certain parts of the artwork I will use my fingers to blur out the pastel and the gloves do an excellent job of keeping the artwork safe from any dirt, moisture or natural grease from my hands. Disposable gloves are inexpensive and I highly recommend using them if you plan on using your fingers. 
that will help to keep your artwork archival and the best condition it can possibly be in. Stay tuned to see how I use them properly in the methods and techniques section of this video. Next, I would like to mention kneadable erasers. These are perfect for using with my favourite paper, pastel mat. As this drawing surface has a lightly sanded texture, a normal eraser does not work well as it can't reach down to the tooth of the paper. However, using a kneadable eraser can easily pick up excess pastel from the surface when needed. You could also mould the eraser into thin points if you need to erase thin lines for example, there are many different techniques possible with these. This may seem like an obvious one, but pencil extenders are vital in assisting me when my pencils get too short. There's nothing worse than trying to hold and work with a pencil that's nearing the end of its life. As soon as I put an extender on one of these pencils, the cramp in my fingers disappear and I regain much more control again. I highly recommend putting extenders on all of your short pencils. Once they get too short, it will make your life a lot easier. The final tool I would like to mention here is a belt sanding machine. As pencil sharpeners easily break pastel pencils, I carefully use this machine to sharpen my pastel pencils to a thin point. I first shave the wood casings with a Stanley knife and then use the sanding machine to sharpen the pastel nib to a sharp point. The hoover is also attached to this machine to suck up all of that pastel dust. I should also note that for the Caran d'Ache pastel pencils, I use only the sander machine and I avoid any knives because shaving the wood casings often breaks the pastel. This is because they are a soft pastel pencil and therefore prone to snapping. I'm not suggesting that you need to or should use a belt sander machine, this is simply what I do. For a safer option, you can simply use sandpaper or even disposable nail files to manually shave your pastel tips to a point. I also tape down sandpaper near to where I work to occasionally sharpen my pastel nibs quickly while I'm stuck deep into a drawing. As we are on the topic of the belt sanding machine and before we move on to the methods and techniques, I think it's a suitable time to talk about staying safe with soft pastels. Staying on the topic of using the sander machine, here's what I do to make it even safer for myself. As mentioned, I always use the hoover with the belt sander. The sander has an outlet pipe which the hoover attaches onto and this helps to catch any of the dust from the pastels. This can only go so far though. I also keep an air purifier next to where I sand down my pastels and this will help to catch any fine dust that's in the air. It also just helps to keep my studio more dust free which is great for the health of my lungs. When sharpening a lot of the pencils at a time, I will also wear a protective respiratory mask, mainly because I have asthma, but I also think it's important to breathe in as little pastel dust as possible. Furthermore, I always use pencil extenders on pencils that are becoming shorter so that my fingers are far away from the machine as possible. You may have seen me hoovering up the pastel dust throughout this video, and it's really important that this is done for a number of reasons. When we work with soft pastels and there is a buildup of dust on the paper, our first instinct may be to blow it off the paper. This may seem to solve the problem, but what you're actually doing is spreading the fine pastel dust particles all around you. This will inevitably build up in your lungs and around your studio space. Furthermore, blowing on the pastel dust many times will deposit the dust in areas on the paper that you don't want it to be. This is easily shown on white pastel matte paper where you'll start to get a faint muddy cloud of colour on your paper where the pastel dust has stuck to. And yes, pastel pencils can create just as much dust. If you blow on the dust many times over a drawing that you're working on, you will ruin the colours and tones throughout over time. Instead, hoover up the dust as you go along and resist the urge to blow it off. It's important to make sure your hoover contains a HEPA filter to catch all of that dust. All household hoovers should have one. If you work vertically like me, this is less of an issue as the dust simply falls to the floor, but this still needs to be regularly hoovered up off the floor too. Framing and storing soft pastel artworks isn't as straightforward compared to other mediums. As I don't use any fixatives on my artworks, because I want the tones and colours to stay the same, the pastels can easily be disturbed, smudged or ruined. This is why it's important that you know how to properly take care of your artworks as soon as they're finished. 
If you have put all the final touches on your piece and you're ready to hang it proudly in a frame, it's important that your frame includes a picture mount inside. It's also important that your portrait is taped to the picture mount around the back with acid free tape so that it doesn't slip down over time. This will mean that the frame has to be bigger than your artwork to accommodate this picture mount. This is needed as the picture mount leaves a much needed gap between the artwork and the frame glass. Imagine if the glass was pressed up against the artwork, smudging and disturbing of the pastel pigments may occur as they're still technically loose on the paper. If you use pastel mat, the paper will hold your pastel together very well, but it's still important to frame it this way, so that it reduces the risk of any disturbance. Plus, I think picture mounts always make an artwork look much better, so it's a win-win for me. This soft pastel drawn here is actually a drawing I recently created of my German Shepherd which we have hung on the wall in our room. This drawing is also the outcome of a Patreon tutorial where I recorded the whole process so feel free to check that out also if you would like to learn my methods and techniques for drawing realistic dogs. As you can see on the back here, I have taped the picture mount to the back of the portrait in the four corners like so. You can use more tape if you wish, this is simply how I did it for this piece as I figured this would be enough to hold it in place. Once you are happy with your artwork in a suitable frame, it's always a good idea to keep it out of direct sunlight and also away from areas with a lot of humidity. This will increase the longevity of your artwork. As soft pastels are simply pure pigment mixed with a little binder, they are said to have one of the highest light fastness ratings, meaning that they will stay in their original condition for a very long time. If on the other hand you are not ready to frame your artwork, or you simply want to just keep it in storage, I'll show you what I do with my own artworks. I first place a sheet of glassing paper over on top, and this helps to keep the artwork air, water and grease resistant. It doesn't disturb the pastel when placed on top and it's also semi-transparent which makes it easier to pick out the artwork. Once the glassine paper is in place, I then place this artwork into a plastic sleeve. I purchased my plastic sleeves from a brand called Mapac as they are acid free which is very important for keeping your artwork safe. They also come in all different sizes. I'll link in the description to this video where you can find them if you are interested. I will show you an example on a smaller piece as I have no extra large artworks with me right now but if you have a really large piece you want to store but can't find any plastic sleeves to fit, I recommend to tape glassine paper to cover the artwork and then wrap it up in multiple layers of acid free tissue paper. Once you have taped up the tissue paper so that the artwork is secure, tape it down to a custom sized cut foam board and sandwich it between another of the same size. You can buy large sheets of foam board online. I then like to tape the corners like so and this will keep the artwork tightly fit inside and stop any chance of the artwork falling through the corners and becoming damaged. Hopefully now that you have a better understanding of what is needed to protect soft pastel artworks once they're finished, we can now move on to actually using them and start creating. So we'll first start by using this gorgeous pink soft pastel colour and just create a light layer by using very little pressure, almost just letting the pastel glide on the surface of the paper. You can see how some of the paper is showing through. Now let's do the same but with a hard pressure. This will cause much more of the pigment to be stuck into the tooth of the paper and you can see the difference here already. So if I then decided to blend out the light layer with my sponge, not much would happen as there isn't much pigment to be moved around. However, when I blend out the more pigmented layer, you can see how easily the pastel can be moved around. You will also notice the excess pastel dust disappearing and this is because the sponge is pushing it into the paper. Okay, but what if we wanted to make a gradient? I'll start by shading in the one end with a hard pressure and then slowly transition into a light pressure. Next, I'll take the second colour and do the opposite. I'll start with a light pressure and then end with a hard pressure at the other end. The two light layers crossing over in the middle will blend in together easily as pastels are great at mixing together in light layers. To blend with my sponge, I start from one end and gradually shift the pastel down in small elongated circular motions gently going up and down the gradient to mix it all together evenly. 
This may take a little practice to get used to if you haven't done this before, but just be patient with it. Use a gradual light pressure and small circular motions. And just like that, you can see how easy it is to create gradients using soft pastels. Let's try that again, but with another set of colours. I first make sure to turn my sponge head around so that I have a clean sponge to work with. I'm going to take a dark and light blue, so a bit of a more extreme gradient than what we have just previously done. But I'll do the same method again, starting with a hard pressure and then ending just over the middle with a light pressure and then repeating the process for the second colour. So now with the clean sponge head facing down, I can lightly start from the one end and then gradually make my way down to the opposite end. Notice how I'm holding the handle further back, this will allow me to use a light even pressure throughout. As I continue to blend this out, you can see that it's not so smooth, there are small uneven patches. This can sometimes happen when creating gradients with light colours. Not to worry though, as all I need to do is just add another layer of pastel on top and repeat the process. Once I slowly blend this out again, everything will begin to smooth out as desired. Again, I want to use a light even pressure, going gently from one end to the other. Now I will try using two completely different colours together, pink and blue just by repeating the same process. It's important not to contaminate your colours with your sponge though, so don't go straight from blending the pink to the blue. Sponge contaminations for gradients can be bad, but for other drawn areas they can also be useful. I will explain further soon. To make sure I'm not going to ruin the wrong colours, I first check to see what pigment is already on my sponge and start in the blue area. Notice how I don't just jump back to the blue side, I need to gradually follow my sponge along down the gradient to create the smooth transition. Again, if the gradient isn't as smooth as we would like it to be, we can always draw in another layer and blend again. Often I will also use my fingers to blur everything out even more. This is especially useful on large scale gradients where everything gets nicely smoothed out. Using my fingers will softly blend the pigments together. Unlike the sponge where a lot of the pastel gets moved around, using my fingers just helps to create a soft blur effect of the area. It's important not to use too much pressure here as it can cause blotches and patches in the pastel. I also like to wear disposable gloves to protect my fingers from the pastel and also to protect the artwork from the natural oils on my hands. We can also test the different ways of how to apply pastel pencils to our paper. We can create light layers which are perfect for working in multiple gradual layers. Check out my realistic cherry drawing tutorial for pastel pencils which covers this exact topic. I will leave a link in the description. And we can also apply more pressure with our pencils and create more opaque layers. Here you can see just how easy it is to deposit the pigment down especially when you can compare pastel pencils to colour pencils for example, they are a much faster medium to work with. Gradients are also possible with pastel pencils. Using the same method as we did with the pastel sticks, we can gradually fade one colour into the other. Although, it's important to note that sponges won't work well to blend out pastel pencils as they're not as pigmented. The same reason why the sponge didn't work well on the previous light layer of soft pastel. 
To make the pigment smooth out with pastel pencils, we just need to keep adding light layers on top of each other until there is enough to fill out the tooth of the paper. Once we have achieved this, it will make everything appear smooth and transitioned. So here I'm now using the second colour, starting with a light pressure in the middle and then ending with a hard pressure, just like how I did with the pastel sticks. You'll notice that there is a lot of the paper still showing in the middle where there is less pigment. This is fine as it will gradually get covered as we slowly add more layers. What you do not want to do here is to try and rush it by increasing the pressure. You need to build up light gradual layers for a smooth transition. Whereas with the soft pastel sticks, you can sometimes even get away with one or two layers. Pastel pencils need many more to complete the transition, but the results are always worth it. So as I'm going back and forward with my pastel pencils here, I'm using a harder pressure at the ends and always a lighter pressure towards the middle. So I'll just quickly finish these light gradual layers and speak to you once it's complete. To blend the pastel pencil gradient out even further, once you feel it's completed and there's no paper grain showing through, you can then use your finger to very lightly blur everything together. You don't want to use too much pressure here as it will likely make the pastel blotchy. We just want to gently push the pigment around so that it incorporates with each other. This also compresses the pastel into the paper and locks it into place. Now let's have a go at creating new colours by combining two different colours together. Let's say that I don't have a purple colour readily available. Colour theory tells me that if I mix this pinky red and a blue colour together, then it should form a purple colour. So to mix these two colours together on the paper, I'm first just doing a light layer of the red and then I'll do a light layer of the blue. I'll then repeat this process for a total of four layers. You can see that there is already a hint of purple showing, but the magic happens when we blend out the pigment with our sponge. Making sure I have a clean sponge head facing down, I can then use a light pressure in small circular motions to start blending the two colours together. You may see that there are a few lines within the mixture. If I wanted this to be even smoother, I could simply add more light layers after blending till I get the desired result. Here I'm just going to show each colour either side so you can compare how the two colours created a whole new one. So now let's do the same but let's make a green from the same blue and a different light yellow. Again I'm just going to glide the pastel on the paper with the aim of creating a light even layer. I'm looking for the layer to be light but also for the lines to be even and for the white of the paper to be uniformly covered. All while making sure to only have a light layer. This wouldn't work well if I used a hard pressure and caused too much of the pigment to be deposited. So now that I have my four light layers, I make sure that I have a clean sponge head facing down and I can begin to blend those layers together by using a light pressure. As these two colours together are more extreme than the last example, you can see that the lines in the mixture are even more visible. So I'll now show you an example of another layer after blending to create an even smoother outcome. So now that we have the full six layers down after adding those final two, we can now blend that out and straight away we can see how much smoother that looks. There are many combos to try with this as pastels are designed to be blended in with each other. Adjusting the colours and tones can be so easy that you don't actually need many variation of pastel stick colours. Sure it helps to have a wide choice but you can always create your own colours by combining others. I will again just finish by showing you the two colours used so you can compare them to the blended out colour. 
Many times when I am creating pastel pet portraits, I need deeper, darker golden colors for example. Let's take this golden color as a base and then introduce a dark warm brown to the mixture. There are obviously tons of combinations you can do, it can be really fun creating new ones, so I definitely recommend that you give it a try and see what colors that you can make. I won't make another gradient here, but rather show you how we can turn one corner into a different tonality. In this case, a deeper and darker golden. Once I blend the pigments together to incorporate them in with each other, you can see how they've blended and become a sort of similar version of each other. This is just one example of how to change a base color layer. To smooth this out and finalize this area, I can go in with my fingers and gently blur the pigments together. So now let's create that same golden yellow base layer, but instead of using another pastel stick to add in different colors and tonalities, we can use pastel pencils instead. You could even use a different pastel stick and a pastel pencil if you'd like, it doesn't matter, but I'll stick to pencils for the purpose of this demonstration. To keep it similar to what we have already done, I'll take a brown pencil and start shading in this side with a light even pressure. Remember that as pencils carry much less pigment than pastel sticks, it means that we are unable to blend with our sponges, rather we should use our fingers for a more gradual and gentle technique. You'll notice that even blending with our finger causes much of the brown to fade into the base layer, and that is due to the base layer still carrying much more pigment. Once we have done one light layer, we can then repeat the process as many times as we need to for the increasingly opaque layers. You can see that this has gradually darkened this corner of the base color layer quite nicely, and we can also do the opposite on the other corner. Here I will take a light ivory colour with the purpose of lightening the base layer. Again, doing the exact same as before, using a light pressure with gradual layers to build up a light layer. I will then blend this out and repeat the process to intensify the change. It really helps to have a sharp pencil that you can hold to the side like I'm doing. That way you are much more likely to have a smooth even layer as opposed to if you had a blunt pencil and held it more vertically. So now hopefully you can see even more of the endless possibilities with having a base layer and using different coloured sticks and pencils to alter them. The next method is one of my favourites and it is the sponge transfer. Once I have used the sponge in a particular area such as this black, instead of using the pastel stick to put more pigment down next to it, I can simply use the pigment that's already on my sponge and use that to draw directly onto the paper. This works well with almost every darkish colour. You can keep picking up as much pigment as you need and then transfer it to any other place. What's more is that this new area that we have purely created with the sponge is soft and very light. This makes it perfect for adding pencil details on top. As I am a pet portrait artist, this is really handy for drawing dogs with black fur for example. I can draw in all of the very dark areas with a black soft pastel stick and instead of using greys for the lighter areas, I can simply transfer some of that black pigment over with just my sponge. Because these new areas have a very light layer, the pencil details will be easily opaque on top. As long as I use a light pressure with my sponge, I can have a light area of pigment that is perfect for adding in details on top. And it's usually the lighter areas that require the most pencil details on top for the highlighted fur. This will lead nicely to the next part in explaining how too much pigment will make it difficult for the pencil details to go on top. You can see that the pencil marks just went on very easily on that light base layer. Well, let's add even more pastel to this dense area and see how the details from our pencil show up. Using the same black pastel with a hard pressure, I'm just trying to fill in as much of the tooth as the paper so you can really see the difference it makes. Using the same medium pressure with my pencil, you will notice straight away how the pencils are unable to leave the same opaque lines. This is because the tooth of the paper is filled in with too much pigment and so the pencils can't deposit any more pastel. A little trick which can often help is to use a kneadable eraser. 
This will lift some of the excess pastel up from the paper and make it easier for details to go on again. Hopefully you can see that straight away the paper was able to grab the pigment from the pencils once that excess was removed. So lastly we will now have a look at how well each different brand of pastel pencils performs at drawing in details. I'll quickly create a relatively dark base colour layer and this is what our pencils will be drawing on. Each brand has a different level of softness to their pastels. The softer brands typically leave more opaque lines and the harder brands leave less opaque lines. Here I have put down way too much pigment so I'll first hoover up the excess dust. It's important to always stay safe when using pastels and doing this regularly helps to keep our lungs clear over time. To aid the pencils I will lift up that excess just as how I previously described in the last section with a kneadable eraser. Then I will lastly blend with my fingers to smooth everything out. I will start with the harder brands and finish with the softer brands so that you can see the difference. I'll make sure that all the pencils are the same level of sharpness and I'll use the same medium pressure for the details. So first up we have Faber-Castell Pitt Pastel Pencils. And these are quite a hard brand of pastel pencil, but they are perfect for sharp lines. Harder pencils keep their sharp nibs much longer, but their lines do tend to be less opaque. Faber Castles are perfect for shading in tone adjustments as their layers are very smooth and even. This is another great feature of hard pencils. The next pencil we have are the Durant Pastel Pencils and these are slightly softer than the Faber Castells. I absolutely love how they perform and they're always a go-to brand for me. You can see how vibrant and sharp their lines are. They do have a small tendency to snap at the tip though. This brand comes in many different colours and I love how they achieve their details. Next are the Stabilo Carpathello Pastel Pencils and these are the perfect mix between soft and hard. They are some of the first pastel pencils I ever purchased and they might be my most used alongside the Faber Castells. They are smooth on the paper while also leaving crisp details. I'm always confident when using the Carpathellos as I know that they will perform well each time. For a more softer pencil, we have the brand Brunzeal. As well as being cheap and having a great range of grey shades, which I love, these pencils are very pigmented and I'm always impressed by how well they deposit the pigment onto the paper. I highly recommend this brand, especially for beginners, as for the price, these are very high quality. And lastly, we have the softest pastel pencils in this list and those are the Caran Dash. As they are so soft, they are prone to snapping and breaking. If you drop one on the floor, then it will probably need to be sharpened again. They're not so great at shading in, I have found, just because they are so soft, so it's hard to get a light even layer. However, I reserve the Caran Dash for the most vibrant and opaque details. They are buttery smooth on application and really allow you to take your final details to the next level. They are on the pricier side but I will always recommend them as they are just so opaque. So now looking at this area from left to right, we can get a sense of how the hardness of a pastel pencil can affect how it lays down the details. To recap, hard pencils leave less opaque but sharper lines, whereas softer pencils leave more opaque lines but they go blunt much quicker. So here is a quick look at all of the different sections we have covered for this methods part. If you're new to soft pastels and pastel pencils, I really hope some of these explanations were useful to you. If they were, please do let me know in the comments. Now taking many of the principles I have talked about here, let's get straight into the realistic drawing of sliced oranges. I chose to draw these sliced oranges because I really love the vibrancy of the piece and the play of light. Drawing stills such as fruit or other objects can really help you to understand the medium you're working with. The full in-depth tutorial and real-time videos for this drawing are already available on my Patreon, but let's get right into this drawing now. So like with many of my artworks, whether they are stills, animal drawings, seascapes, I always start with a base colour layer using the soft pastel sticks. 
Do you remember from the method section where I blend two colors to create a darker tonality? Well, this is what I'm doing in this dark area of the orange now, by using a dark brown with a vibrant orange. It may look a bit messy at this beginning stage, but as soon as I start blending the pigments together with my sponge, everything will become incorporated and smooth. Remember, for this base colour layer, we don't want to use a hard pressure with our soft pastels. If we did, then it would be difficult to put pencil details on top. So instead, we want to build up our colours in light, even layers. You can see already in this base colour layer, I will mix many relevant colours over one another. This is just the same as creating a new colour as I showed you in the method section. Now I'm just quickly going to finish putting in the colour for the leaves and then start to blend everything out. It's important to start with a new sponge head when beginning so that there is no contamination of colours. What you can do also to save money on lots of replacements is to get a spare piece of pastel matte paper, deposit a lot of the pigment from the same pastel stick that you need to start blending out and pre-contaminate your sponge with the correct colour. To show an example of this, my sponge head here is already contaminated with a green colour from a previous artwork, but I want to start using it in an area with blue pigment. Let's pretend this paper is my spare paper, all I need to do is put a heavy layer down and proceed to blend it out. Now my sponge is contaminated with the right colour and I could go ahead and start blending my actual artwork, without changing to a brand new sponge head. Okay, so back to the sliced orange artwork now, once everything is evenly blended, it could still look a little ugly, but now it's time to refine everything with our pencils. There is no right or wrong place to start these details, just begin wherever you feel most comfortable. Instead of going around the whole area and gradually refining it all, I like to complete little sections to the best of my ability and then move on to the next one. There is no pressure though as I can always come back at the end and refine some older sections even more if I needed to. My main aim here was just to copy the reference to the best of my ability and choose really rich and vibrant colours. I wanted to make sure that this piece was bright and colourful so it would stand out. Here is the part where I start refining the surface that the oranges are on. Do you see on the reference photo that there is a subtle orange reflection? This is the light bouncing off from the orange and it's really important to input details like this. To do this, I used light gradual layers with my vibrant orange pencil and blended this out with my finger. The centerpiece for this artwork is this slice in the foreground. This is where I need my pencils to be the sharpest as it's the most in focus. When compared to the oranges in the background, they are slightly blurry so capturing this is crucial to convey a sense of depth. It also brings the audience's eye to the center of this artwork. As you can see, I am using very vibrant colors to really bring this center slice to life. I just absolutely love how the light is shining through and lighting the whole thing up. Now I'm going to add in the texture lines that I can see on the branch. And to do this, I'm using a sharp gray and a sharp black with a hard pressure. I can also see some subtle orange reflections, so I'll be sure to add those in with a sharp orange. I'm also adding in a subtle cool grace to this outer edge for the darker parts before moving on to drawing in the vein texture details that I can see in the foreground slice. For the veins, I'm using an orange pencil which shows up perfectly against the light yellow base layer. I'm then shifting my attention to the center details where the slices all join up. There's a lot going on in this area and you can even see the orange behind showing in through the gaps. Then continuing with the vein details, I will use vibrant pinks, oranges and whites, just aiming to follow the pattern that I can see in the reference as best I can. Shifting my attention to these leaves on the right side, I will alter their tones and colours by using vibrant turquoise and yellow colours, using a light even pressure with my pencils. Once blending and incorporating the pigments with my fingers, I'll then use this bright vibrant yellow to bring out the highlight for this orange before moving on to the inner details of this background orange. As I mentioned before, this orange is in the background and is slightly out of focus. This is important to replicate so I am sure not to create any sharp details. I can also lightly blend with my finger if I want the detail to be more blurred. I'm also going to add in the subtle hard to see vein textures of this orange with an orange pencil before moving on to refining the foreground slice even further. I'm just adding some of the highlights and darker textures that I can see on the outer edge of this slice and I'm using a colour picker to see what colours I need for a specific area. 
I think that is looking pretty realistic so I'm going to shift my attention to this last orange now. I'm first going to refine this gorgeous glowy colour that we can see next to the foreground slice. And then with light gradual layers I will add in the correct colours and tones with a mixture of sharp orange, red and brown pencils. Throughout the Patreon tutorial you can see how I provided colour picked examples so you can see what sort of colours we are looking for in the various areas. Here I'm using this vibrant pink with the aim of really making the area feel like it's glowing with light. Before I move on to the details here, I just quickly want to refine the left side of this outer slice by lightly adding in turquoise and greeny brown tones. To begin adding in the details, I'm just going to pick off some of the excess pastel with my needle eraser so that the pencil details will go on well, just as how I showed you in the method section. Using the opaque Caran d'Ache pastel pencils for the highlights and an orange for the darker spots, I'll add in the texture as I can see it on the reference. I will often touch up with my vibrant pink just to keep that glowy vibrancy high. I can then start gently lightening up this darker side with subtle greeny browns and start filling in the dot texture with a deep red. It's important to choose rich colours where you can. If I chose a black for this dot texture, it would look flat and overpowering. So just for some of the final touches to this section, I'll use a white for the very highlighted sections and also vibrant colours for the relevant parts to keep everything looking bright. To finish this artwork off, I will lastly further refine the colours and tones of the leaves. I'm using light pressures with various shades of greens and yellows to just improve upon the tonalities as I can see them on the reference photo. Once an artwork is finished, I always like to leave a small signature in the corner and then I can call that piece finished. I really hope you like the outcome, I think there's always a lot to learn from drawing stills such as this. You can take a photo of anything and turn it into a drawing of your own, which I think is great. If you would like a much more in-depth lesson for how to draw this piece, I have the full 5 plus hour real time and over one full hour tutorial on how you can draw this piece from start to finish. The tutorial on Patreon also features how to achieve the accurate outlines to begin your drawing, as well as my method for choosing the perfect colours every time. This is just one of many tutorials I have on Patreon and I would love for you to join me and my other students already learning over there. There are three different tiers to choose from and for a small monthly fee, you can access hundreds of hours of content to guide you with your art skills immediately. You can also cancel your subscription at any time that suits you. The link to Patreon is in the description if you would like to see what's on offer. I just want to say a huge thank you for watching this all the way through if you have. I've lost track of how much time I've spent putting this together. I know it's a long video but I really wanted to share as much useful information for beginners, the things that I wish I knew before starting. So if this video has helped you out in any way, please feel free to subscribe to my channel and also to like this video. You can also check out any of the relevant links in the description and I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments. I recently also created a short but sweet purely pastel pencil tutorial that focuses on drawing realistic cherries. Feel free to check that out to learn even more about the possibilities with pastel pencils. I have also put together this extremely helpful soft pastel and pastel pencil guide that is completely free so absolutely check that out if you would like further tips, tricks and knowledge. Thank you for watching and I hope to catch you in the next one.